judge of Karnataka High Court. Came that day, it was also first, and today also it's first. And as they say that if you have something common, and his the way his sessions are doing well on the previous one, we expect that it will continue to remain one of the fastest moving sessions because the way he takes insights of a particular topic is always hearty and it gives the insights which anybody can understand. In fact, it is one of the rare webinars where normally I got messages to the effect that they had heard this message webinars, time and again with the ease with which he spoke. Now, the search, seizure and arrest are important aspects under the NDPS Act, though in other criminal jurisprudence also it plays its important aspects. Um, and section 41, 42, 43 and 50 also are the important aspects as such, which one would like to understand. And coming from a speaker who is not only known through his judgments, but is erudite speaking of things and hammering the point, as they say, hitting the nail at the top of the head. It's one of his art, which is Michael Kunahid. He was quite busy taking sessions with the Karnataka Judicial Academy. We continued to persuade because we kept on receiving the messages that we should call Mrs. Kunah. And as they say before, the Gandhi said the most peaceful way is the best way to persuade somebody. And eventually Justice Kunah accepted and it's, uh, that is all in the lighter way, and he has always that important clip to give the knowledge. And today we are partners with Vikram and Associates in this webinar. I will ask Mr. Vikram to give a, just a brief point, and in the end, we will have his conclusions from him. Over to you, Vikram. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Because I think you have not left any single point for me to uh, <laughs> mention here, and I wouldn't take I wouldn't take much time because I don't want to come midway and uh, people are set to listen to his lordship. So once again, on behalf of uh, Beyond Law CLC and my personal behalf, I extend a very warm welcome to his lordship. Over to your lordship. Yes. So thank you, Mr. Vikas and uh, Mr. Trivikram. I think straight away, getting to the subject, we are going to discuss, I think only four sections out of the total 83 sections contained in the uh, NDPS Act. And uh, all these provisions are procedural in nature. I think the general understanding with the advocates or with the judges, I think the, that the procedure is only a handmade of justice. So even if there is any violation in the uh, the in, in uh, complying with the requirements of the procedures, I think that may not affect the substantial uh, uh, substantive rights of the parties, unless of course the accused is prejudiced thereby or any miscarriage of justice is caused. I think that is the general impression. But when it comes to the NDPS Act, I would say that better not we carry this impression. I think as all of you may be knowing the scheme of the act. See, the, unlike the traditional crimes, say like murder, theft, assault, etc. The NDPS Act deals with a special species of the offenses and that too of recent origin, what we call it white collar crimes or the socio-economic crimes affecting the public at large. And moreover, these crimes are committed by organized gangs, well equipped with all modern gadgets or modern te uh, technology. I think the ingenious way they operate or they commit these offenses, it far surpasses the expertise or the acumen of our law enforcing agencies. I think of late, I think on the 29th itself, you might have read in the newspaper, that four foreign nationals were apprehended where they were involved in growing hydro ganja in the villa where they were staying. And that too, what the news states, using LED lights, heaters, and temperature regulators. You can imagine how far and why in what sophisticated manner these offenses are committed. And added to that, if you see, 
that even the law commission in its 155th report uh, has observed that there is generally nexus between the politicians law enforcing agencies and the offenders indulging directly in such crimes i think it is all because of this the stringent provisions are devised under the act to contain this menace of oh, drug trafficking and drug addicts i think the presumptions are carved or enacted in the act special courts or the special machinery is constituted both for the purpose of investigation and for conducting the prosecution the special procedures are laid down and more than that wide powers are conferred on the investigating agencies even and the investigating agency can arrest on the spot without even complying with other ordinary procedures what we find in uh, in crpc or any other uh, criminal uh, jurisprudence or the criminal procedure so that being the case there is certainly there is a likelihood of the powers being misused to the disadvantage of the accused and therefore the provisions what we are going to discuss now if you really see that these measures are prescribed under the act only to safeguard the interest of the accused it is to provide or provide a measure for the fair investigation and for fair trial which is a constitutionally recognized guaranteed right of an accused therefore when we discuss these four sections we should not we should do, uh, approach this with the, this perspective we should not go under the impression that these are the procedural matters we have got nothing to do with the uh, trial of the accused if you understand the significance and the implications of these uh, uh, what you call these four provisions i would say their importance cannot be undermined at all now in order to understand what is the effect or the implication of these provisions i would just request all the viewers just to take note of the fact that the provisions relating to search seizure arrest are found in the criminal procedure code i think there are all of you may be aware section 41 deals with the powers of the police officer to arrest section i think i need not to dilate on that uh, provision section 46 prescribes how the arrest has to be made section 51 says search of the arrested persons in chapter 7 we come across section 93 search warrant by the courts section 100 which is very relevant and which has got a bearing on the subject what we are going to discuss deals with how to conduct search of a closed places what all requirements or preconditions to be followed by the police officers how he has to warn how what is the document he has to prepare to to instill the regularity or to instill confidence in the procedure or in the arrest or this uh, seizure that he has uh, effected section 165 Uh, deals with the search by the police officers without warrant so therefore what we must understand is that there are enough provisions in the crpc for effecting the search arrest or seizure and even if you see section 51 of the ndps act section 51 provisions of the code of criminal procedure 1973 to apply to warrants arrest searches and seizures so even the special procedures what we are going to study the act itself says the provisions of the code of criminal procedure shall apply in so far as they are not inconsistent with the provisions of this act to all warrants issued and arrest searches and seizures made under this act so the provisions of crpc are made applicable even by the specific or express provision of the act itself and in this context if you see section 4 of crpc even section 4 what it says all offenses under the ipc shall be investigated inquired tried 
or otherwise dealt with according to the provisions herein after contained. So for IPC offense, the procedure prescribed is as per the CRPC. Then all offense under any other law shall be investigated, inquired into, tried and otherwise dealt with according to the same provisions. So CRPC basically is applicable not only to the IPC, but also to the other laws, but subject to any enactment for the time being in force, regulating the manner or place of investigating, inquiring into, trying or otherwise dealing with such offense. So except to the extent that is provided in these special acts, I think the provisions of CRPC are made applicable to all the offenses, the investigation, trial, or the entire, all the incidental uh, uh, matters connected there too. So this matter, we should remember because it has got a bearing on the discussions that we are going to have. In other words, the point that I want to tell you is that provisions of CRPs are applicable even to the searches, seizure, or arrest made under the provisions of the, in respect of the offenses under the provisions of NDPS Act, except to the extent provided therein. And what is that ex uh, except to the extent provided in the, the special act? And that exactly is what we are going to deal today. And that is the provisions or a special procedure which is contemplated in section 41, 42, 43 and section 50. So we can locate the very provisions of the act. So it is this uh, the special procedure, how it differs or uh, differs from the general provisions and only to that extent we have to apply the uh, these provisions to any investigation or to any search or arrest that is made by the investigating agencies. I think if we go into this act, of course, these uh, four provisions, they on the appearance, I can say they are, look very lengthy and uh, uh, what you call repetitive. But uh, I think we can explain, you can understand these uh, provisions or the gist of it itself. We can immediately we can gather. See, section 41 deals with the power to issue warrant, it deals with the issuance of warrant, that is subsection one of section 41, deals with the issuance of warrant. Of course, for the purpose of effecting the arrest, search or seizure, it only subsection one deals with the issuance of the warrant. Who can issue the warrant? Under this provision, a special procedure has been contemplated is because of the nature of the offense, it says, a metropolitan magistrate or a magistrate of the first class or any magistrate of the second class specially empowered by the state government in this behalf may issue a warrant for the arrest. So this subsection 1 of section 42 states that a warrant for the arrest or search or seizure could be issued only by the magistrate specially empowered, not by any other ordinary magistrate, specially empowered and second condition, what he has to do to, to issue the warrant to in this behalf, he may issue the warrant. So specially empowered magistrate to for arrest of any person, he has reason to believe to have committed the offense. So one precondition, I said, these provisions are engrafted as a safeguard to the accused to protect from the arbitrary use of powers by the investigating agency. To say that he is been accorded with a fair investigation, a fair trial. And therefore, one of the safeguards is that if a search or an arrest has to be made, the warrant must be issued by the magistrate empowered. And that magistrate should have reason to believe that an offense under the provisions of this act has been committed or any of the or any evidence is of relating to that offense has been concealed. So that is the subsection one deals only with the issuance of the warrant by the magistrate. Subsection two deals with the authorization by the gazetted officers of the department. See that uh, because is, having regard to the, I said the way in which the offenses are being committed, a special procedure has to be made for to expedite the investigation without waiting for all these procedural assets. So therefore subsection two says 
see uh, uh, subsection 1 says the uh, warrant can be issued by the special uh, by the empowered uh, magistrate subsection 2 an authorization can be issued by the gazetted officers of the department of the central government which are those departments central excise narcotics customs revenue intelligence or any other department of the central government so it should be gazetted officer officer including the paramilitary force or the armed forces is empowered in this behalf by general or special order so that gazetted officer also must be empowered by a special order or a general order or any such officer of the revenue drugs drugs control excise police or any other department of the state government is empowered so and the gazetted officers of the central government of the following departments or the gazetted officers of the state department who are duly empowered by a special order so that is essential otherwise if that condition is not fulfilled the whole exercise will go far so that is the uh, idea so then so he can authorize but on what condition what are the on what basis he is empowered in this by general or special order if he has reason to believe from personal knowledge or information given by any person taken down taken in sub section 1 is addressed and the officer who authorized the arrest or search who is so authorized under sub section 2 shall have all the powers uh, powers of an officer acting under section 42 so an officer who is either armed with the warrant issued under 421 or an authorization issued under 42 he becomes a competent person or an authorized officer to search or arrest so that is the uh, section 41 section 42 deals with the power of search seizure and arrest without warrant or authorization see that first is that is obtaining the warrant then power of entry search and arrest without warrant or authorization any such officer so that means who has been authorized there or who has uh, uh, this one what you call uh, has obtained the authorization that person if he has reason to believe at the middle of the section if he has reason to believe from personal knowledge or information given by any person taken down in writing so these are the safeguards because if he is going on a routine job and he suspects someone if to know whether what he is doing is legal or not otherwise he can implicate any other person therefore the law says that if it is without warrant or authorization then if it is in relation to the uh, he must record that reason that personal knowledge or information given by any person had taken down in writing that any narcotic drug or psychotropic substance or control in documents or other things which are available so then he himself can conduct the raid between sunrise and sunset and in the process he can enter and search he can break open he can seize the substance and he can detain and search see all these powers are given but further if provided further if such officer has reason to believe that a search warrant or authorization cannot be obtained without affording opportunity for the concealment so between sunset and sunrise even then he can do it provided he records the grounds of his belief so first is uh, the power of search without warrant or authorization uh, second uh, that is the procedure of uh, obtaining the warrant and the procedure of obtaining the authorization when there is an authorization such person can conduct the search such conduct the search during sun between sunrise and sunset so this is from the enclosed places and sub section 2 says when an officer takes down any information in writing under sub section 1 or records grounds for his belief under the proviso he shall within 72 hours send a copy thereof to his immediate official superiors these are not empty formalities see this is to these are these formalities of course we will uh, discuss what is the legal effect of it whether they are directory or whether they are mandatory but in order to validate the search validate the arrest validate the seizure 
this is a he has to comply with these preconditions these safeguards then only the proceedings conducted by him becomes valid section 43 deals with the search in the public place see the difference what you can see is that when the search is from the enclosed place from the conveyance if he has got an information the procedure is that he must either obtain the warrant or obtain the authorization then only conduct the search and even while conducting the search he must record the reasons and communicate it within 72 hours to his official superiors if it is from the open place none of these procedures need to be not this uh, preconditions required to be followed so here the power of searcher the only thing is the requirement is that the search should be or the seizure should be from the public place any officer of any of the department mentioned in section 42 so 42 means only the gazetted officer or any of the officers who has been authorized by the gazetted officer may seize in any public place or in transit any narcotic drug or psychotropic uh, substance or control in respect of which he has reason to believe an offence punishable has been committed committed uh, or, or any article may which may furnish evidence has been considered then he can seize it it does not prescribe any condition at all any condition at all then he can detain search any person whom he has reason to believe has committed an offence because the uh, provisions have got a purpose to serve an officer one who is let us say he goes to the routine uh, routine uh, check out what to call bandobast or any other routine duty then he finds if a such person moving suspiciously then what is if he had previous information about to the commission of that offense by that said person then the law says he cannot get into section 43 he must follow the procedures under 41 on 42 42 but without to having any information if he finds a person and he arrest him as a routine that arrest that seizure will be under the provisions of crpc only but while conducting the search if he comes to know that he is in possession of any contraband which is an offense under the ndps act from that moment he should stop he should stop and he should hand over the investigation or you should follow the procedures contemplated under that see the uh, what you call the underlying principle is whether he has got an information of an offense so that is the only safeguard if he had information of an offense otherwise i think that uh, investigating officer can act arbitrarily without think he can implicate any person and can say that he was involved in that just to, to know that what action uh, he has taken has got to validity for the interest of, to safeguard the to to, to ensure the accused that he has not been falsely implicated the some procedures have been laid down so it is only on complying with these procedures he has to proceed otherwise his action becomes tainted suspicious so therefore the law says when he has got an information go through under section 41 or 42 and then between day and day night you effect this search even if there is no warrant you record your reasons and during sunset and during the night also you conduct the search provided there is something in writing recorded and the copy of it is sent to the superiors but if it is the, from the public place then no such requirements or preconditions have been prescribed under the act because of the nature of the offence section 50 section 50 am i am i clear if anyone wants to this one uh, interact they can always ask if i am not very clear Yes. at the end of the session we'll go ahead with that we'll go ahead. yes see section 50 deals with the personal search so when either under warrant or let us say without warrant or under authorization or from a public place if a person the person of the accused has to be searched see there's a difference between searching the conveyance searching the place and searching the person section 50 is applicable only when the person is to be searched then section 15 provides the safeguard or the precautions that is the person one who 
conducts the search must give an option to the accused or to the suspect that whether he wants to be searched by the gazetted officer or by the magistrate and if he expresses uh, if he says that he wants to be searched by the gazetted officer he should be taken before the gazetted officer or the magistrate without giving this option if he conducts the search the search becomes illegal or invalid i think that is only section 50 so these are the uh, what you call the precautions or the safeguards that are, these are only the four uh, this one uh, procedures a special procedure that has been engrafted under the uh, act to protect the interest of the accused because this is the if at all the accused can set up any defense i think under this act having regard to the stringent uh, uh, punishment and the especially the what you call presumptions i think this is the section 41 42 and 43 and section 50 are the only defense that we, we can say it would be available to the uh, accused therefore uh, this is the this provision any person practicing the, on the or representing the interest of the accused must know that any search any arrest or any uh, seizure would be valid only if it is from the closed place 41 and 42 if it is from public place he must satisfy that it is a public place now for example recently there was a uh, there was a case i think for uh, that buta singh buta singh it was in a live law it was uh, reported where a person was kidnapped or apprehended he was sitting in his jeep in his jeep and uh, in a public place the jeep was a private jeep it was a private jeep and he was found in a possession of the a possession of the uh, articles the question was whether the place where this contraband was found is it a private place or public place so all the trial court and the high court held it is a public place because it was found in the on the public road which has got an access because you may be knowing that is uh, whether it is a private place and a public place i think the law takes a different uh, uh, shade or a different color in a different uh, uh, situation for example if a person is wearing a mask is not wearing a mask in his private car we say that he is going in a public place even in excise department if he is drinking in a public place even if it is in a uh, private car we say it is a public place so when uh, so that being the interpretation all the courts said that uh, no it was a he was in a public place so therefore the investigating agency need not comply with any of the preconditions prescribed in section 41 and 42 but the honorable supreme court uh, disagreed in that buta singh case i think 2021 uh, decision and it said that section 43 explanation for the purpose of this section the expression public place includes public conveyance hotel shop or other place intended for use or accessible to the public it said a, a private vehicle private jeep though it is in the public place it is not a public place therefore the non compliance of the requirements under section 42 and 41 would entitle him for acquittal see that is how the law because that is the effect of uh, this uh, uh, these provisions these are not what are, that's why i told you the general provisions are there under the crpc but these special provisions are enacted keeping in mind the special nature of the offenses because the police every time the investigating officer cannot uh, cannot be expected to run after and get a an warrant so he has been authorized to act even to immediately to get into the job even by authorization from his department but to safeguard the interest of the eq says to validate such a action he must strictly complied and therefore all these provisions compliance of section 41 42 43 and 50 are held to be mandatory so if you want to go through what is the legal effect of these or the implications of these provisions of course you can find any number of decisions but i would just uh, give one decision which is of a uh, of a recent decision tofan singh versus state of tamil nadu 
Tofan Singh versus State of Tamil Nadu. AAR 2020 Supreme Court 5592. Of course, the question involved in this uh, case is whether an officer empowered under section 42 and 53 are police officers and whether the statement made by the accused under section 67 of the act, whether it is a confessional statement which is hit by section 25 of the evidence act. So that was the point which was under consideration. So to determine or to answer this question, the court has uh, gone through in detail or, this, or has summarized the entire law relating to the sections 41, 42 and 43. It has uh, and analyzed the what you call the development of the law because right from the constitution bench decision till late, how the law was laid down and how it was diluted to say, and what is this, uh, the present position of law, I think that has been uh, dealt uh, very elaborately. And in this decision, therefore I said uh, only one decision, it uh, analyzes all the previous decisions. So therefore this one decision, I would say, is a compendium by which you can uh, get to know the present position of law with regard to the legal effect of the, the four provisions what we are discussing today, whether they are directory or mandatory. See here, this uh, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court has uh, referred to the Constitution Bench decision in Baldev Singh, Baldev Singh 1999, 6 SEC 172. That decision had taken into consideration the conclusion arrived at by two judge bench of in a state of Punjab versus Balbir Singh, that is 1994 Supreme Court, 1872, 1872. The questions considered above arise frequently before us because instead of dealing from point to point, I'll just refer to this. I think that gives a fair idea of what the what the issues that are likely to be arisen in considering the applicability of these four provisions are dealt. The questions considered above are, arise frequently before the trial courts. Therefore, we find it necessary to set out our conclusions, which are as follows. One, if a police officer without any prior information as contemplated under the provisions of NDPS Act makes a search or arrest a person in the normal course of investigation into an offense, or suspected offense as provided under the provisions of CRPC. And when such search is completed, at that stage, section 50 of the NDPS Act would not be attracted and the question of complying with the requirements would not arise. If during such search or arrest, there is a chance recovery of any narcotic drug or psychotic substance, then the police officer who is not empowered should inform the empowered officer who should thereafter proceed in accordance with the provisions of the NDPS Act? This is what I told you. Now, for example, a forest a officer, police officer, who is not empowered, I said to validate the search or seizure. It could be done either when there is an information, because that is a, a precondition. When there is an information of the commission of the offense, you can proceed only under warrant or authorization from the gazetted officer. Now, here is a case where a police officer who is not an empowered officer at all, then in the routine checkup, he comes across or stumbles upon a case. And during the search or interrogation, he comes to know that the person is in possession of the contraband, which is an offense under this act. Then what should he do? Then the search or the arrest or whatever procedure so far he has conducted will be treated as the procedure under CRPC, either under section 41 or under 100 or 165. But the moment NDPS, uh, this one is that he has to stop. And from that stage, 
the authorized officer has to continue. Authorized officer, if he has to continue, he has to follow the same procedure. He has to send the same procedure. So next, under section 41.1, subsection 1, only the empowered magistrate can issue warrant for the arrest. See the legal implications. So we need not run to any, what is the position of law. This one decision has uh, summarized the position of law. He says under section 41.1, only an empowered magistrate can issue warrant for the arrest or for the search in respect of the offenses punishable under chapter 4 of the uh, chapter 4 of the act uh, when such warrant for arrest or search is issued by a magistrate who is not empowered then such search or arrest if carried out would be illegal so here itself we can what is the legal effect so if the person who issued the warrant is not empowered by special order or is not an authorized officer which, which has been authorized in terms of section 42, then the search becomes illegal. Next, under subsection 41.2, only the empowered officer can give the authorization. If there is a contravention, that would affect the prosecution case and vitiate the conviction. See the results of it. So generally we said the procedural violation does not affect the substantive case unless prejudice has been shown. But here is the provisions which I showed you, told you are enacted for the interest of the accused to, to give him an opportunity or a forum for fair trial, fair investigation. Therefore, any violation is treated as a, uh, this one, the compliance of it is treated as mandatory and violations will render the entire trial vitiated. Then under section 42.1, the empowered officer if he has prior information, he should necessarily take it down in writing. It is nothing but a reproduction of the conditions or the preconditions what are there in 41 and 42. So it said he must necessarily take down in writing. He may carry out the arrest or search without a warrant between sunrise and sunset. So if he takes down without a warrant also, he can, of the magistrate, he can do that. If there is an authorization and a the information has been taken down. That means sufficient compliance. To this extent, the provisions are mandatory and contravention of the same would affect the prosecution case and we shared the trial. So every stage by stage, they have said the effect. 41.2, if it is no empowered, it vitiates. 41.2, it vitiates. Then under section 42.2, such empowered officer who takes down any information in writing or records the grounds under 41.2, should forthwith send a copy thereof to his immediate official superior. That is another condition. If there is total non-application of this provision, the same affects the prosecution case. See, here I want to tell you, because if you read this entire judgment, gradually the law was diluted. Because what was earlier, it was held that if there is, a, uh, there is all these provisions are mandatory, non-compliance of any of these conditions, any of these conditions would render the entire exercise futile. It will vitiate the trial, entitling the accused for acquittal. But gradually, the some of the courts, even the Honorable Supreme Court said, if there is a substantial compliance or if there is a delayed compliance, let us say the section says within 72 hours, we have to send the information to the superiors. Let us say it is sent beyond 72 hours. Then, even though there is delayed compliance, you take it as a substantial compliance. Or, for example, other conditions which are required. One or two conditions are uh, satisfied. He has uh, taken down, but has not sent. Still, we say that there is a sub substantial compliance. So, therefore, it says that that was the position of law. But now, with this decision, even everything, all gray areas are, uh, no gray areas are long left. The matter is uh, set down. Now it says that uh, once the conditions are prescribed to safeguard the interest of the accused, they are to be treated as uh, mandatory. If it is mandatory, they have to be complied in full, in total, or no, not at all. You can't comply it in part and say that there is substantial compliance. There is no scope. That is the present position of law that has been laid down in uh, this uh, decision. If a police officer, even if, uh, uh, section 4A, police officer, even if he happens to be an empowered officer, 
by effecting an arrest or search during normal investigation into an offence purely under the provisions of CRPC fails to strictly comply with the provisions of 100 and 165, including the requirement to record reasons, such failure would only amount to an irregularity. That's why I said first, I told you, you must take note of the provisions contained under section, under the CRPC. CRPC is made applicable to the search and seizure. While effecting, now for example, section 41 and 42 prescribe only the mode of issuing the warrant or the who is the competent authorities. It does not say how the search has to be made or how the arrest has to be made. Section 100 says when the, under warrant when you make the search, you have to get two respectable persons. Then it says you have to prepare the search memo. You have to give the copy to the other. If these requirements are also required to be complied, so that means section 100 and 160 has to be complied. If you do not comply with the requirements laid down under 116, then uh, 100 and 165, then that can be maybe treated as a irregularity, but not the other provisions. So that is the distinction. So if there is in compliance of the provisions of the section 100 and 103, if there is any violation, you can treat it as an irregularity, but not the compliance of the conditions or the preconditions laid down in 41, 42, 43 and 50. So that is the difference. And therefore, after this uh, judgment, after the, this judgment, so this judgment was rendered by the bench in 1999. In 2000, amendment was brought. Amendment was brought to section 50. And if you see section 50, section 50, they said section subclause 5 was introduced, introduced inserted with effect from 2001. When an officer duly authorized under section 42 has reason to believe that it is not possible to take the person to be searched to the nearest gazetted officer, see how the law was tried to be, the what was initially intended to be a mandatory provision after this judgment, because what it said is that compliance of or failure to comply of 100 would only be irregularity, the rest of things are mandatory, then it said, so when it is not possible to be searched by the nearest gazetted officer or magistrate without the possibility of person to be searched parting with possession of any narcotic drugs or consorted substance, he may, instead of taking such person to the nearest gazetted officer, may proceed to search the person as provided under section 100 of CRPC. So he said, even if it is not possible, you record the reasons and you proceed under section 100. But that has been interpreted now in this decision. He says, when the entire intention of framing or enacting section 42, 40, 41, 42, 43 and 50 is to safeguard the interest. These are to be treated as in the nature of mandatory nature. So therefore, it said that section 100, what the subsection 5, you can implement it or you can enforce it, use it only in exceptional circumstances. Otherwise, the compliance of these conditions are a must. The prosecution must prove, for example, that he has given him the option. How to say that he has the, given him the option to be searched by the gazetted officer or by the magistrate. Generally, the investigating officer takes down in writing in writing and uh, these provisions also, if you see that whatever writing or the signatures that has been taken are deemed to be correct. And a presumption is there under section 66. So he exercised that option. That will be the proof. His signature should be there. So otherwise we have to take it. He has not followed the requirement, mandatory requirements of section 50. And he cannot take shelter stating that uh, because it was not possible, therefore I have uh, followed or conducted the search under section 100. See, that is the difference. Hope you, you understand the, uh, what you call uh, emphasis. And the emphasis is that. So you cannot, as a routine course, follow under section where section uh, 42 prescribes or 43 or 50 prescribe certain preconditions. Those preconditions are mandatory. Yes. Then the effect of such failure has to be borne in mind. On prior information, the empowered officer or authorized officer 
while acting under section 41.2 or 42 should comply with the provisions of section 50 before the search of, search of the person is made and such person should be informed. So it says again, the repeating the same uh, thing. Then see that another issue also arose because I said uh, the law laid down by the constitution bench, it was tried to be interpreted in a different way. See, in a, there was an earlier decision. If the property is seized or recovered through an illegal search, whether such property or such object, material object, can it be relied on, which is recovered through illegal search? See, under general criminal law, criminal jurisprudence, even if the search is illegal, the property recovered could be relied on. And that same view was applied to the NDPS Act also. It said that even if it is a, uh, what you call, uh, uh, even if the search is illegal, you can consider or accept the, uh, accept the properties that are seized. But in this judgment, it has been said, even that is not possible. That is not what has been laid down by the constitution bench. You can't incorporate a condition which is not there in section 50. 50. So it has, been, it has been said that that even the property recovered is has to be treated as illegal and cannot be relied on at all. So these are this in Puran Mal's case. I think in Puran Mal's case, 1974, it was held that property recovered through illegal search could be relied on. But that position also, it is said now, it cannot be uh, applied to NDPS cases. In NDPS cases, these provisions are mandatory. If there is no compliance, there is a total non-compliance, there cannot be substantial compliance at all, then the benefit should go to the accused. So these are the, uh, uh, these are the provisions and ultimately, if you see in uh, section in para 55, In para 50, thus this extremely important safeguard continues or as has been uh, as has been originally enacted subject only to the exception in subsection 5 and 6 which can only be used in urgent and emergent situations. So the ultimate conclusion of the Honorable Supreme Court by analyzing all the earlier uh, provisions or the law is that, uh, that recourse to section 100 could be taken only in exceptional circumstances. Otherwise, compliance of each and every condition is mandatory. This court has clearly held that non-compliance of this provision would lead to the conviction of the accused being vitiated and that substantial compliance with these provisions would not save the prosecution case. So the position of law is very clear. So the whatever preconditions that are laid down in section 42 are mandatory in nature. There must be total compliance mere Delayed compliance or substantial compliance is of no use at all. No use. So that is the position of law. Hope you have understood. And there are uh, these are the provisions and the legal effect. And uh, on the same uh, point, I think you can also note one decision of the Constitution bench in Mukesh Singh. Mukesh Singh versus State of uh, or versus State NCB. 2020 10 SEC 120. Here, of course, the issue was whether the investigating officer and the complainant can be one and the same. Because you may be knowing the special procedure here. See, the name of the informant is not to be disclosed as per section 68. Then who is the complainant? That is when the information has been received. That's why I said these safeguards are there. Safeguards in 40 to 42. When information has been received, he has to record it, record it in the concerned register and then take further action, either authorize or he himself conduct the search. And that after conducting the search or after effecting the arrest, that person and that property, either it should be produced before the magistrate, if the magistrate has issued the warrant, or it should be produced before the nearest station house officer or the authorized officer. So that is the procedure and the report submitted by him at that time becomes the complaint. 
So the complainant or the informant is not the complainant. The FIR is not registered. Therefore, that is the significance of this, uh, this one. So thereafter, the investigation, actually real investigation starts. So here, arrest seizure takes place before registration of the case. Therefore, the only material, reliable material is the, the information recorded by the officer. So that is the rationale. That is the reason behind these uh, rules. So therefore, the question arose whether there is, whether the complainant and the investigating officer can be one and the same. The Mohan Lal's decision case was there. It said, if he is one and the same, the entire thing is vitiated. Prejudice is caused. Prejudice is caused. But uh, Mohan Lal's case is, uh, uh, is reversed. Is reversed in this decision. And it said, when it comes to NDPS Act, the section itself, section 53 itself authorizes. Because that is the scheme of the act. Because of the nature of the offenses. You can't first disclose the name of the other in the FIR, then there is nothing will be there to search. Nothing will be left if you follow the routine procedure in the CRPC. Therefore, the name of the informant is kept secret. Then all other procedures commence. Then the investigation, the authorized officer under section 53. And section 53 says that the very same person one who conducted all this procedure, the gazetted officer, he himself could be or an authorized officer by the gazetted officer under section 42. He himself could be the investigating officer. So there is nothing wrong. And in this decision, even the Supreme Court, that the five judge bench, the constitution bench, they have said that even the law, even in the criminal law also, you can't stretch it this principle saying that the complainant and the investigating officer cannot be the same. It has said that even under criminal law also, there is no invariable rule. In the NDPS Act, because of section 53 itself, the act itself authorizes the complainant and the investigation officer to be one and the same. But even under general law also says that the general principle is that he can be unless the accused shows prejudice. But here the question of prejudice does not arise at all because section 53 authorizes it. So these are the provisions you should know it. So other decisions are there, but all these decisions are referred in the uh, Tofan Singh's case. Therefore, I have given you only one decision where the entire gamut of law has been discussed. Discussed position of law is very clear. Authoritatively, law is laid down. Therefore, there is no ambiguity at all in the application or the legal effect of or the compliance of section 41, 42, 43. See, there is section 57 is there. Section 57, one section which I now to touch. Report of arrest and seizure. Whenever any person makes any arrest or seizure under this act, he shall within 48 hours next after such arrest or seizure, make a full report to all the particulars of such arrest or seizure to his immediate official superior. This is not mandatory. This is a, a post seizure or post arrest stage. Whereas Compliance of the requirement is before arrest as laid down in section 41 and 42. Therefore, non-compliance of this provision does not vitiate the trial. You make a, the, this one understand the difference. Here also it lays down in condition, but it is not mandatory. This is because after the, the aftermath, what he has to do it? After uh, effecting the search or the seizure and all other things within 44, this is not mandatory. This operates in a totally different sphere. Whereas the conditions prescribed, the preconditions or the safeguards provided under section 42, 41, 42, 43 and 50 are mandatory. Non-compliance of it will vitiate the entire trial. So these, were, these are the only defenses that could be available to the accused. So we must understand and appreciate the provisions in that manner. So this is what already I thought that Yes. Hmm. Vikas, I think uh, Bingo, his lordship has taken exactly 60 minutes. Yes. That's the hallmark of uh, any successful person. <laughs> they say time, time is the essence. <laughs> what yes. we do, uh, read in the Limitation Act, time hmm? is the essence for any contract. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh. So out here, we don't have anything. Let me check it out. 
I was just checking it in the YouTube also. We didn't have any questions. No questions. I'm just checking it out on the Facebook, YouTube, yes. and uh, the thing we don't have. One has then. Ruchi Jain, what is the use of words if such a person so requires? If it is compulsory to take him to the magistrate or a gazetted officer in section 15? No, if that person wins, that person, that option is to be given to the accused. See, the option has to be given to the accused. This provision, as I told you, is enacted to protect the interest of the accused. Because I said, wide powers are given. Presumptions are enacted. Wide power is given. Even on the spot, he can make an accused. I said, from public place. No warrant, nothing. Not even recording, he can do it. So there is a likelihood of misuse. But... See, he can also plant any of the things within. Therefore, to protect all these, to protect the accused from all these, uh, what you call aspects, say, a right has been given to the accused. Or in precondition, safeguard, which is enacted in section 56, if he wants only, because it's an option, an option is given to him, whether he wants to be searched before the gazette or officer, before the magistrate. That's why he gives it in writing. In writing, if he says that before the magistrate, then he should be taken to the magistrate. So therefore, that's the defense he can take it. He can say that uh, I was I, I exercised my option to take it to the magistrate. He has not done it. See what the magistrate what they has to do that. If we cannot be taken to the magistrate, he would record the reason and conduct the search under section hundred by taking recourse to section fifty subsection five, which has been inserted. That has been interpreted by the honorable Supreme Court in Tofan's case, saying that that can be resorted to only in exceptional cases. Otherwise, you have to go through this procedure. You have to give an option. So that is because it is in the interest of the accused, it is left to, for him to take that exercise, that option or not. Option has to be given in English or it has to be given mandatorily under the... It is, it is because any such uh, option, it should be made known to be understood because other if it is in a language which is not understood, it is in the interest of the a, a prosecution that he says that it has been explained and has been written. If it is in English and if it takes that, how can he exercise? So that is not, that may be one of the ground for him to say that there is non-compliance. That itself may sometimes, because this is a stringent provisions, stringent provisions, because asher the uh, offense, asher the punishment, the stricter the proof. So therefore, any such, even these uh, single elements also may help the accused. They say for a uh... Harsher punishment or a harsher this thing, it has to be given literal interpretation rather than the liberal. Yes, interpretation. yes, exactly, exactly. So that what we said that you are substantial compliance, delayed compliance, partial compliance is a good meaningless because when the law says that uh, total compliance, either total compliance or non-compliance at all, that has been interpreted in this, and that seems to be the correct because otherwise there is now, for example, say how that uh, for example a student activity day, let us say he should be. Uh, implicated in this offense. One day is going by his bicycle, as a scooter. The police can stop it or in the, in the routine uh, check and ask him for his documents. One of them may be checking the documents. Other may take the key and go to his uh, scooter, open the dash box and put, put something in that. Is it not possible? So therefore, all these precautions are there to say that the, to avoid or to prevent such misuse by the police because the power has been given to them to arrest on the spot. Therefore, it says that if you had any information, you take it down writing. Otherwise, you say if it is a private place or a public place. So all these things that will are sufficient rather that is that balances the right of the accused and the right of the investigating agency and the prosecution. So that is the beauty of this uh, uh, provisions. Yes. Lordship could only elaborate uh, on the uh, registration of, of an FIR subsequent to the seizure yes. in light of Lalita Kumari's case. Uh, yes. little, but that would be, I think, uh, beneficial. Now, see, Lalita Kumari says that whenever an information is given of the commission of a cognizable offense, the police have got no other option than to register the FIR. But that is the Interpretation of section 154, 156 and 157, 157 and uh, even if you see that under I think para 103 or something like that, they have said in five types of offenses, that is I think uh, matrimonial offenses and uh, 
करप्शन करप्शन ऑफेंसेस एंड इकोनॉमिक ऑफेंसेस यू नीड नॉट रजिस्टर दी एफ आई आर यू कैन मेक ए प्रिलिमिनरी इंक्वायरी एंड हियर सी द नेचर ऑफ द ऑफेंसेस आई सेड दीज आर द कमिटेड बाय द गैंग एंड वेरी सोफिस्टिकेटेड मैनर आई सेड द हाउ दे कैरी हाउ दे हाइड दिस इट इज एंड इफ दे गेट ए लिटिल क्लू दैट द पुलिस विल बी अरेंज दैट दे विल नॉट गेट एनी ऑफ द एविडेंस therefore all these uh, procedures but and under that circumstance if you insist that an fir should be first registered then it should be taken to the magistrate thereafter only you commence uh, investigation that is it says that is the section 68 says name of the informant cannot be disclosed that is otherwise if that is disclosed i think uh, no offense will be, uh, come to light at all the informant uh, i think he has to fear his life and uh, no one will give any information but to say that see that is actually the information in the nature of the first information to say that there is an information you should record it in writing you need not to register the fir but the scheme of the act is that after that see, sufficient safeguards are there for the accused because the information is recorded in writing to show that that is a real information the copy of it is sent to the higher officers so two proof are there two safeguards two safeguards then it is followed by your recovery which guarantees the truth of the information this itself regularity gives a kind of a, what you call sanctity to the entire procedure so therefore not registration and therefore it says when after completing this that person and the accused under section 52 section 52 says that if he is arrested under warrant the person and the property should be produced before the magistrate if he is arrested under the authorization he should be produced either before the station house officer or before the authorized officer under section 52 53 he himself is the investigating officer at that time the person who conducted the search submits the report and that is the meaning if you see the section 53 that is the section 53 the central government after consultation of uh, that power to invest the office uh, state government see on the uh, report or see based on this report he has to proceed any officer of the narcotic and uh, the state government notification published uh, disposal of section i think there is the uh, this one provision uh, ah yes Uh, section 36 the jurisdiction jurisdiction subsection uh, uh, subsection 1 d a special court may upon perusal of the police report of the facts constituting an offence under this act or upon complaint made by an officer of the central government so there is no fir or the information so when he searches it otherwise he can file a private complaint also on that only he can take cognizance yes and it is in conformity it is not in a violation of the dictum of the lalita kumari because that itself provides right yes i can say but there are judgments in which it has been said compulsorily like rf khan consent was taken by the police but case went in favor of the accused what is the what is that can i sir so it, it is in continuation of the previous question i can read the entire question what you had answered first what uh-huh. is the use if such person so requires if it is compulsorily to take him to the magistrate or gazetted officer in section 50 but there are judgments in which it has been said uh, held to be mandatory like in arif khan consent was taken by the police but case went in favor of the accused that arif khan it has been explained now it is not laying down the correct procedure correct law i think that has been explained in this uh, uh, decision all this uh, earlier that was not the intendment you can't read that into section 50 is what has been said of course the detail i have not read out only the salient aspects i just read out if you go through this they have reproduced the step by step step by step and they have okay. they delineated it yes so it is a very elaborate uh, the lengthy decision but through so light on it and it has uh, cleared much of the gray areas and i would say there are hardly any gray areas are left now earlier that is whether the complainant and the investigating officer could be one and the same whether without registration of the fir with the procedure you know, because generally under crpc we say that all uh, regi- before registration of the fir any proceedings are conducted we say it is invalid 
I think of the high court, our high court's so division bench decision is that it is in well. But here the law permits it. This is a special act. Here the CRPC is made applicable, not made applicable en masse. Some provision are applicable, made applicable. Some provisions to some action. So that's how it has been made applicable to the act. Yes. Your insights once we conclude the session. Uh, yes. Again, uh, thanks, Mr. Vikas, for facilitating this wonderful opportunity. In fact, uh, as I told you earlier, we were missing his lordship. It used to be like a classroom. We used to get room when we were sitting in the court hall. And again, you have facilitated by giving us this opportunity. And the topic chosen is such a wonderful topic, especially for the practitioners uh, practicing on the criminal side. Uh, may it be on the trial side or uh, before the High Court or Supreme Court. These aspects are very important, either for coaching or for conducting the trial. And his, uh, none other person could have been so erudite and uh, precise uh, except his Lordship. Thank you very much, uh, Your Lordships, for this wonderful session. Yes. And thank you, Mr. Vikas, for uh, giving us this wonderful opportunity. And uh, for me also, in particular, to speak about his Lordship and this particular uh, uh, presentation. So, thank you. Uh, your, your Lordship had said that, that the judgment has thrown the true light. I will say that his session has also actually thrown the true light. We have all come out of the dark alleys in, which could have been in the mindset, and especially for the youngsters, it will help them. And tomorrow we will be having session on tips on translation, which is an important aspect, not only for the examination part, but also once you are doing in the high court. What could be the tips for translation so that they are less of mistakes? It would be by Mr. Vasant Patwardhan, who is a Shrishtadhar at Bhadami, and he is also taking a lot of sessions down south in the Karnataka. But do stay connected with us tomorrow at 6 p.m. And thank you, sir. Your session was excellent. And we all learned from it. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you.